I am uh, intrigued by sport. And many of you are intrigued by sport. I'm intrigued by how intrigued some of us are about sport. And I'm also intrigued by how some of us care nothing about sport. And sports is uh, very much a part of our society. It's a part of our culture. And, I, and I'm intrigued by it. I'm intrigued by uh, the dedication that goes into it, the sacrifice that goes into it, the skill level, the strategy that's involved, the ups and downs, the winning and the losing. But by far, the thing about sport that intrigues me the most is the emotional involvement. I am amazed at how emotionally involved I can become in a game that I haven't sacrificed for, I haven't given up for, I haven't practiced for. I mean, I try not to do this, but do you, do you ever hear, or maybe you're guilty of this, when you refer to your team, you use the word we? Like you've ever been on the field with them? <laughs> but we've got a good chance this year, we're playing well, we this, we that. It's amazing to me the emotion that's involved in it and how, and how it can impact us. I'm also intrigued on the other side of how people don't have any emotion with sports. I mean, they have no connection with it. And it's just it's like that part is pretty amazing to me as well. One of the things that we've been doing in our family uh, lately is watching this thing called American Ninja Warrior. I don't know if anybody sees American Ninja. Yes, American Ninja Warrior. And my daughter Amelia has kind of got me hooked on it because she loves to watch American Ninja Warrior. And so I've been watching it. And so this past week, I'm watching this deal where they're, they've got the best American Ninja Warriors in the U.S. And, and they're in this competition with the Europeans and the Japanese. So I'm, immense, I'm immediately intrigued in what is going on. And so I find myself in my house this week watching American Ninja Warrior, mainly because football season's not in. But I'm watching this, and my heart is beating fast. I am pulling for guys I've never heard of, doing this obstacle course that's insane, and I'm watching them, and I'm like, I'm cheering for them. I'm rooting for them. I'm wanting them to win. And the USA did not win. The Europeans did. And I was sad that they won. It's just fascinating to me that I, that I got that hooked and that emotional, involved in something that three or four months ago I could care any less about. Now, here's another thing that's intriguing. My wife cares nothing about sports. Nothing about sports. But she watches American Ninja Warrior. And the reason she watches is because of the stories. And the producers of the show have done a really good job because they tell these stories. They have these athletes come on and they tell these stories. And so when, when, after the story, Lisa says one or two things. I don't want that person to win. Or she says, I so want that person to win. And it's got nothing to do with the competition. It's got nothing to do with their athletic skill. It's all got to do with their story and she knows their story and I'm sitting there going I could care less about the story can we fast forward to the stories let's just see what his time is going to be <laughs> right so so I'm fascinated about how that how that impacts us I mean emotion is such a powerful thing and how it comes at us in so many different ways now most of us at church on a Sunday morning in the middle of summer associate with God in some way or another and a lot of times we associate with God in an emotional way. And we're, we're, we, we understand, we, 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 we want to know more about God, we want to worship Him, we want to be pleasing to Him, we want life to go well. I mean, there's all kinds of things and all kinds of reasons that we can be emotionally connected with God and with Christianity and with the local church. As in all sports, there's a winner and a loser. And a lot of times during the game, you're looking at who's winning, who's losing. And when it comes to God and Christianity, it's very easy for us to look at the world and look at our country and even look at our own individual lives and, and come away with this conclusion that God is not winning. That Christianity is not winning. And that we're losing. We say that on a world scale. We see it on a country scale. Uh, our country scale, and we see in our own individual lives. I mean, our own individual lives so many times, it feels like I'm just, you know, I'm not winning at this thing called Christianity. I'm not winning at this deal of how do I walk with God. No, I'm, not, I'm just not doing it very well. 
Psalms 37. It's been read to us this morning from the stage. It is a powerful, powerful psalm that talks about the emotion, that talks about this idea of walking with God, that talks about God, talks about the godless, and talks about the godly. And, and I really connect with Psalms 37. Primarily, I think the reason I really connect with it is this. It starts off by saying this, don't worry about the wicked. Because when you're trying to do the right thing, and you feel called to do the right thing, it's so easy to get look around and be destroyed by the wicked. And to look at everything that is going on in people's lives and our own individual lives and say, wow, man, this just isn't, this isn't good. So Psalms 37 is written by David and he writes, this, writes it and, and it's so fitting not just for today, but for always. Because this idea that God is not winning, that Christianity is not winning, is not a new idea. It's not a new feeling. It's been around for a very, very long time. And so David is writing this psalm. There's really three main parts to the psalm. And, and this is part two of, of last week. And last week what we looked at is we looked at, we looked at the, god, the godless part and we looked at the God part. And we're going to review that now. So here's what we do. In, in the Psalms, David just, he just goes through and says, here's some characteristics, here's some behaviors of the godless. They fade away, they prosper. Because a lot of times as Christians, we don't want to think that. We don't want to think that godless people prosper, but they do. They scheme, they're destroyed, they'll disappear. They plot against the godly, they're defiant. They, re they respond with violence. They destroy themselves. They borrow but never repay. They ambush the godly. They look for excuses to kill. They flourish for a season. They have no future. And that's just going through the psalm, just listing off the things that the psalm talks about, that this is what the godless look like. This is what they do. This is how they behave. This is how they think. And then in the psalms, he's got some things that talk, he talks about God. He talks about promises of God and things that God does. He gives us our heart's desire. And if you weren't here last week, you can go back and look on our, uh, our webpage or the Facebook and the sermons posted there. We spent a lot of time talking about that, how God gives us our heart's desire. He helps. He blesses the innocent. He laughs at the wicked. He takes care of the godly. He gives eternal inheritance. He blesses and he curses. And a lot of times what we want to do is we want to just focus on the blessing part. We know that God blesses, but we don't really want to necessarily think that he curses. But God blesses and he curses. There's a winner and a loser. Even if you're not into sports, there's a winner and a loser. And in God's economy and the way that God has set it up, there is a winner and a loser. He blesses and he curses. He directs the steps. He delights in every detail of our life. He holds us by the hand. He loves justice. He rescues he builds us a fortress, he saves, and he provides shelter. Now, the thing that I really like about Psalms 37 is it's not that it just gives us a warning about the godless. And it's not that he gives us the hope and the promise of the things that God's going to do. Because warnings are important, and understanding the hope and the promises of God is very important. But, but the thing that makes Psalms 37 so meaningful to me is that he tells us what godly people do. And if you want to be godly, we have a list of things that we got to be working on. We have a list of things that should describe how we should be living our lives. And Davis gives, David gives us this list in Psalms 37. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through this list of, of the attributes and qualities uh, from the God that, that the godly have. And it starts off at the beginning. Just the thing that just jumps out at me more than anything is this. Is don't worry about the wicked. As a godly person, as a God-fearing person, as someone who says, you know, my faith is in God, I'm a Christian, I'm, I, I'm all in, I shouldn't worry about the wicked. Now, don't confuse worry with plan for. Okay, as a Christian, I should plan for the wicked schemes. As a Christian, I should plan against the wicked schemes, but I'm not supposed to worry I, I, that's not something that I'm supposed to do. And when I find myself worrying about the wicked, do you know what I should do? Stop. Stop worrying. Just stop. So you find yourself worrying about something, you're worrying about the godly, the way just say, you know what, God, I give that to you. You're in control, I'm not, and I give it to you, and, I, and I'm just, I'm just going to not worry. I'm going to plan for it. 
and I'm going to have a strategy, but I'm not going to worry about it. The second thing he says that the godly do is they don't envy those who do wrong. They don't envy those who do wrong. Now, it's pretty easy to envy those who do wrong because those who do wrong in this world and in this time generally get an immediate payoff. There's a lot of wrong that happened in our city last night. Anybody agree with that? Apparently not. <laughs> y'all, do y'all agree with that? A lot of wrong happened in the city last night? You think anybody had any fun last night? Yeah. You think anybody had a great time last night with all kind of wrongs? Go home, tell all their buddies, and they're going to come back in a couple of months, do it all again? Yep. We shouldn't envy that. And the younger you are, the more important this principle is. Because by the time you get old, like some of us, we understand, yeah, you may be looking like you're having fun, but I know what tomorrow's going to be like. And when you're young, you look at that and you go, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. That looks so great. That looks so wonderful. That looks so amazing. And David is saying, godly people don't envy the wicked. Godly people don't envy those who do wrong. The third thing that he, that he says that, that the godly do is trust in the Lord. Now, some of these phrases that I'm using, the reason I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the Hebrew language because there are these really big overarching things that, that um, and a, psych, a psychologist tell us that when we have these big overarching things, we don't do anything with it. Like when you say, my goal is to do better. That, eh. <laughs> you know, that's not going anywhere, Okay. You know, my goal is to get in shape. That's going nowhere. My goal is to save some money. That goal is going nowhere. (laughs) Okay? And so some of these phrases kind of seem like so, but the great thing about the Hebrew language is a very technical language and it means all kinds of things. So I'm going to break down the words, a couple of these Hebrew words to give us some more of an idea of the things that we're supposed to do. And the first one here is this, that works like this, is trust in the Lord. Because we kind of get the idea of trust, you know, You know, if I said, who do you trust? You immediately have names and faces come to your mind, right? Now, if I say, who do you not trust? You immediately have names and faces that come to your to your to your mind. So we kind of get the idea of what it means, but it's not supposed to trust in the Lord. This is what the word trust means. To attach oneself. So when I trust in the Lord, I'm attaching myself to God. It means to confide in, to feel safe, to be confident. To rely on. The picture that's being painted with this phrase, trust in the Lord in the Hebrew is this. It's a confident expectation, not a constant anxiety. A a confident expectation, not a constant anxiety. I'm not supposed to worry about the wicked, correct? If I'm worrying about the wicked, I am in a constant state of anxiety. I'm not in confident expectation. So I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to rely on. I'm going to confide in. The next thing is do good. Another giant, right? I'm just going to do better. That kind of fits in that category. Well, I'm going to do good today. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to do good? I heard Andy Stanley was talking about how he had a chance to interview Bill Hybels and um, they're, they're two giant church guys in church land. And Bill Hybels says this is what he's done. Is that he approaches leadership, being a dad, being a husband, being a a boss, being an employee, being a friend. It doesn't matter what it is. When he finds himself in a situation, he asks himself this question. What would a great leader do? What would a great dad do? What would a great husband do? What would a great mom do? What would a great son do? What would a great daughter do? And he says, when I find myself in those situations, that's what I ask. What would a great employee do in this situation, in this moment right now? And then I go out and do that. I don't worry about the other 85,000 things. I don't worry about, I just, what is right now in this situation, what would a great dad do? And then just do that. That's how you be good. Just one step at a time. One thing at a time. Do good. Then the next one is delight in the Lord. Delight. It's a delightful word, correct? It's not a word you usually say very often. I'm going to delight in this or this is delightful. The word to delight in the Lord. And delight means it's a high degree of pleasure. 
enjoyment, satisfaction. It's the opposite of distress and disappointment. It's supposed to delight in the Lord. It's supposed to delight in who he is. To find joy in his presence. To find joy in worshiping. To find joy. Now, we don't, that doesn't come naturally. So you're going to have to ask for that. You're going to have to say, God, help me delight in you. Because that doesn't come naturally. The next one is commit everything to the Lord. And this may be my favorite one of the whole thing. Commit everything to the Lord. Now, Hebrew, the everything, do you know what the Hebrew for everything is? Everything, okay? So commit everything. That means everything. Even the stuff that you think that's not important. Commit everything that you do to the Lord. But here's what the word commit means. Commit means to whirl to roll in, to be rolled together, to roll oneself upon. Okay, stay with me. Don't don't gross out on me. Okay, I'll explain it. But it also means to be rolled in blood, to be dyed red. Roll oneself upon the Lord. Commit to the Lord. I'm rolling myself around God, in God, with God. Now, if you, if you know the story of Jesus and you know the promise of the New Testament, and you know the significance of the cross, saying to be covered in the blood or to be rolled in the blood of Jesus is a beautiful picture, not a gross picture. And that's what commit. So I'm committing my life. I'm saying, God, I'm all in. I'm giving you everything that I've got. I am going to roll in your goodness. I'm going to roll in your love. I'm going to roll in your mercy. I'm going to roll in your grace. Commit everything to the Lord. Be still in God's presence is the next one. And remember, this is, this is a list of things to do to be still in God's presence. It's important that we be still, but the thing that really matters is that we be still in God's presence. Now, in order to be still, I'm going to have to turn some stuff off. Right? I'm going to have to turn off the television. I'm going to have to turn off the phone. I'm going to have to turn off the iPad. I'm going to have to turn off. Let me be still in the God's presence. And man, this is a discipline. This is something that you got to practice. And if you leave today with a resolve, do you know what? I'm going to practice being still in God's presence. Do not set a very lofty goal. Say for one minute. I'm going for one minute. Be still in God's presence. And when you're done, you will be exhausted. (laughs) And you'll go, I'm glad that minute is over. Because it will seem like an eternity. It is a discipline to practice, but what do godly people do? They take the time to be still in God's presence. So don't worry about the wicked. Don't envy those who do wrong. Trust in the Lord. Do good. What is it? What would, what would, what would a great Christian do in this situation? And do that. Delight in the Lord. Commit. Roll yourself in everything that is God and everything that you do. Be still in God's presence. The next one is wait patiently. Anybody like to wait? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, this, this, nobody has a spiritual gift of waiting. I mean, nobody. This is not what we like. We don't like to wait. Wait patiently. Now, here's what the word patiently means. Uh, I find this one fascinating as well. It means to twist or to turn. To twist, to turn, to go in a circle. Now, if I go in a circle more than once, I get nauseated. So the idea of twisting and turning and going in a circle is not appealing. And a lot of times, that's when we're waiting. That's what it feels like, right? It feels like I'm going in a circle. It feels like I'm not making any progress. I just feel like I, I just, I'm working hard and I'm just right where I started from. But he says, godly people wait patiently. And that means that I'm going to have to twist and I'm going to turn and I have to go in a circle. But here's what also the Hebrew word means. And maybe David meant this. It also means to dance. 
to dance. I mean, if you got to wait, you might as well dance, right? Ladies, you know what else it can mean? To bear a child. And y'all know, for those of you that have birthed children, you know what that's like. You know what it's like to wait patiently? Like, when is this going to be over? And then labor happens. <laughs> and the same word, wait patiently. So dance. It's easy to dance when the band's playing your favorite song. It's not so easy to dance when you can't even hear the music. But sometimes we got to dance even when there is no music. That's what godly people do. He goes on and says, don't fret about wicked schemes, just in case we're not getting that one. You know, don't, don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. He says, don't be angry. Don't get mad. He says that godly people are generous givers. Generous givers. So how's your giving? Every aspect of giving, of your time, of your energy, of your devotion, of your resources, of your money. How's your giving? Because godly people give generously. You ever notice how it's really easy to hate somebody's sin that you don't struggle with? You ever notice that? It's, it's quite a different thing to talk about the sin that you struggle with. In my life, it seemed, I seem to have an amazing amount of grace for the sins that I struggle with. And for the sins that I don't struggle with, I seem to have no tolerance whatsoever. Godly people are generous givers, and the place that we need to be the most generous in all of our giving is extending grace. Turn from evil and do good. This is what godly people do. They turn from evil and they do good. Now, this is really important that you understand the and parts, not just turn from evil. Now, why do we have to turn from evil? The reason we have to turn from evil, because wherever you turn, there is evil. So there's constantly, constantly surrounded by evil, but I've got to turn from evil and do good. Now, remember what do good is? What would a great mom do in this situation? What would a great grandmother do in this situation? What would a great employee do in this situation? And then do that. That's do good. So I got to turn from evil and do good. In order to give up something successfully, you have to replace it with something. In order to give up something successfully, you got something in your life you need to give up. It's not there. It's, it doesn't need to be a part of your life. In order to give that up, you must replace it with something. You just can't stop doing something. If you stop doing something and don't replace it with something that's good and healthy, you're going to revert back to what bad thing or evil thing or destructive thing that you gave up. You can't just give up something. So it's do good. It's turn from evil. That's the first step. And do good. If I have a bad habit, the only way for me to get rid of that bad habit is to replace it with a good habit. That's psychology 101. It's also Bible 101. It's basic. Turn from evil and do good. Offer good counsel. This is what godly people do. We offer good counsel. Now, how are you going to offer good counsel? You have to know good counsel, <laughs> right? So you got to learn. You got to study. You got to know. You got to read. You got to pay attention. You got to apply. Godly people offer good counsel. Godly people teach right from wrong. There's no debate here in Psalms about what, if there is a right and there is a wrong. He's saying godly people teach right and wrong. In order for, again, in order for me to teach right and wrong, I got to know what right and wrong is. I got to know what I'm basing it on. I got to teach it. It's not an obvious thing. It's not something that comes natural. I got to teach. I got to teach. I got to teach. 
which means I have to also be taught. This, this next one I really, we just got a couple more, we'll be done. This next one I really like, make God's law their own. This is huge. In fact, out of all of the things that we've talked about so far, this may be the most important. Make God's law your own. It's what godly people do. You have no problems agreeing with God about the stuff that you agree with. All right? You know the problems you have with God? Is the parts you don't agree with. The parts that don't make sense. The parts that you think you're smarter than God. The parts when your desires get in the way. If I'm going to be a godly person, if you're going to be a godly person, God's law must be my law. It's not God's law was great until I disagree with it. Or it brings up a bad situation in my family. Or in my friendship. Or at work. No. God's law must be my law. That's what godly people do. So what is your confession? What is your confession? What do you confess? Life, liberty, and justice for all? The pursuit of happiness? Money, money, money? What do you confess? Godly people confess God's law, not their own. Then he says to hope in the Lord. And then the last is travel steadily along the path. Travel steadily along the path. And I really associate that one because um, my middle name is Steady. <laughs> kind of like Marty Steady Williams. A lot of times my wife will get mad at me because I'm not getting mad. I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you, but she'll, she'll like throw something at me and say, would you please have a reaction to something? So I love Steady. I love the idea of Steady. It says to travel, and travel means what? Movement. Steady means steady. I'm not up and down, not all over the place. I'm not just changing my mind every time the wind blows. But I'm along the path, and the path is God's path. And I, I, one step at a time. One day at a time. One moment at a time. Travel steady along the path. Now, this is why it's so important. And you're winning by being in church. You are winning by hearing this. You're winning by putting your kids and your children in a situation where they're being taught the truth. And you have to do that over and over and over and over because we're dumb. And Jesus himself calls us sheep. Google sheep. Google, Google intelligent sheep. It, nothing comes up. They're the dumbest animals you can't train a sheep. They literally do not have enough sense to get out of the rain. In fact, without a shepherd, when it rains, their coat can fill up with so much moisture they will fall over and die. That's what God thinks of you. <laughs> and me. So we have to travel steadily along the right path. Over and over and over and over and over and over. That's what godly people do. I've used this many times from John Eldridge. I think it's wise counsel. I think it's good counsel. Hopefully you'll hear it enough. That when you're in a counseling situation with someone, you're having lunch with your friend about stuff, you can, you can repeat this back. Things are not as they seem. We have an enemy. And I have a role to play. Things are not as they seem. It sure seems like the devil's winning. It sure seems like God's dead. It sure seems like the wicked have taken over the world. It sure seems that. Things are not as they seem. We do indeed have an enemy. 
the godless exist and they scheme and they plan and their goal is to destroy the godly. And number three, I have a role to play. I have a role to play. When you look at the Psalms and you look at the promises of God, you look at the warnings against the godless, you look at the promises of God, you look at what the God, this list, this list of godly things that we're supposed to do are all attached to a promise. God will give us the desires of our heart if we delight in him. God will protect us if we commit to him. And I know this gets confusing for us sometimes. My salvation is a free gift by grace. Me placing my faith in what Christ has done. And then he, he gives me his Holy Spirit and it transform, transforms me. So I don't earn my salvation. But I do have to work for my godliness. And David gives us a list of things to do. Here's the thing I'm going to challenge you to do this week. This past week, I challenged you to read Psalms 37 every day. And, and this next week, you're still going to get some tweets out about that. And I, and I hope that you'll do it. But I want to ask you to do this. I want, you to, I want to ask you to do, get a piece of paper, construction paper or something. It's a great thing to do with your family, especially if you've got kids. Put out the craft supplies on the table. Open up to Psalms 37 and say, we're going to make a collage of the things that we're supposed to be doing. And just have some family time. So a lot of you don't know how to have a family devotional. I just showed you how to have one. Okay, it's pretty simple. And if you have a hard time picking out the list from the scripture, you know, I gave, you, gave it to you this morning. <laughs> okay. It's not that hard. <laughs> Something happens when you write stuff down. So you need to write it down. Don't put it on your computer. Don't put it on your iPad. Get an old-fashioned piece of paper, some markers. Make a collage. Because here's what I found. You know the reason I don't worry about the wicked? I got too much to do. I got way too much to do. I got a very specific, real, practical list of things I'm supposed to be doing. And if I'm not doing these things, I'm not godly. And if I'm not godly, I don't get the blessings of God. It's just the way that it works. So I challenge you to spend some time in Psalms 37. Read it. Read it slow. But more importantly, pick some things and start doing some things. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you, uh, we give you our time. We give you the things that we've said and sang about and every aspect of everything that's going on in the life of our church. And Father, as you, as you tell us in this psalm that we're to commit everything to you. And so Father, we commit our time together of worship to you. We commit movie night to you. We commit the women's retreat to you. We, we, we commit Wednesday night the 29th talking about Supreme Court stuff to you. We commit our lunches to you. We commit tomorrow at work. We commit every aspect of our lives to you because we want to win. Father, help us to understand that things aren't as they seem. Always, always remind us that we have an enemy. But most importantly, remind us that we have a role to play 
And thank you for giving us an unbelievable to-do list in Psalms 37. In your name we pray, amen.